yeah, so then in this case, um, thanks for coming, at least um, electronically in this um, awkward times. It's great to have you. And there's quite a crowd that's eager to hear what you have to say. Um, let me just keep it brief. I mean, Tyler Ellison has, a, has an extraordinary track record in notions of condensed matter theory, kind of uh, um, merging with notions in quantum information theory has done work on the sign problem, on topological phase of matter, in all ramifications and, um, and readings. Having done his PhD at the University of Washington, now he's in Yale, so in Eastern time, I suppose. And he will talk about a topic that, well, I'm, I'm told not to say that these are topics close to, my, to our heart, but that's actually a topic close to our heart, um, on Pauli stabilizer models of twisted quantum doubles. So thanks so much for, well, electronically coming and the stage is all yours. Great, thanks for the overly generous introduction, Jens. Thanks to Julio for the invitation to give this talk. And also thanks to everyone in the group for um, being willing to push the talk back by an hour. Hopefully that has given my chance of mind, of, I mean, my mind a chance to wake up. Uh, Anyways, I'm excited to be here and share what we've been thinking about. In short, we've developed Pauli stabilizer models for a large class of topological phases of matter known as twisted quantum doubles. If after I wave my hands around in the air for the next hour and nothing makes sense, here's where you can go for further details. This is our paper. This work was done in collaboration with a large number of folks, Yuan, Arpit, Wilbur, Nat, and Dom. I noticed just this morning that the first letter of their name spells yond. We'll have to see if that's a bad omen for the rest of the talk. Um, let me just re reiterate that uh, questions are welcome. Please don't hesitate to interrupt me if something's unclear. Naive questions are especially encouraged. With that, here are some spoilers for the talk. I'm going to start by motivating our work and giving some background. The motivation comes from quantum error correction. To build a reliable quantum computer, we need schemes for identifying and correcting quantum errors. This comes in the form of a quantum error correcting code. One prominent class of quantum error correcting codes are the topological Pauli stabilizer codes. These are exemplified by toric codes. I'll share an example of a Z4 toric code defined on four dimensional qubits, in part to avoid reintroducing the Z2 toric code to everyone, but also because the details of the Z4 toric code will be essential for the latter half of the talk. There are Many possible topological Pauli stabilizer codes out there beyond toric codes. And an important goal in future work is to be able to identify topological Pauli stabilizer codes that are well suited for a given physical platform. To this end, it's important to develop a classification of topological Pauli stabilizer codes, or in particular, 2D topological Pauli stabilizer codes. One way to classify topological Pauli stabilizer codes is by their underlying topological order. Prior to our work, all topological polystabilizer codes had the same topological order as decoupled copies of toric codes. But in our work, we introduced topological polystabilizer codes based on topological orders beyond stacks of toric codes. As a first example, I'll describe the double semion stabilizer code. This is based on the double semion topological order. I'll show that the double semion stabilizer code can be constructed from the Z4 toric code by condensing certain anionic excitations. I'll then argue that this can be generalized to a much broader class of topological orders, namely the twisted quantum doubles, and we can build twisted quantum double stabilizer codes. I'll conclude by listing some avenues for future work. And if there's enough time, I'll comment on some work in progress. All right, with that, some motivation and background. 
at the risk of teaching first aid to a room full of doctors, but here we go. The problem is that errors are inevitable in quantum computation. They can arise from environmental noise and faulty operations. We need a way to combat quantum errors and that comes from a quantum error correcting code. There are a number of schemes for correcting quantum errors. This talk will focus on a combination of two, the topological quantum codes and Pauli stabilizer codes. As a quick refresher, topological quantum codes operate by storing quantum information in the ground state subspace of a Hamiltonian with topological order. The topological order ensures that the ground states, the logical states are locally indistinguishable. This protects them from local errors. On the other hand, Pauli stabilizer codes encode quantum information in the ground state subspace of a Pauli stabilizer Hamiltonian. These are sums of stabilizers. The stabilizers are products of Pauli operators, which are mutually commuting and also unfrustrated. These codes come with their benefits and drawbacks. Topological quantum codes offer protection from local errors due to the local indistinguishability of the ground states. They also allow for protection that scales well with the system size. If you make the system larger, you have better protection of your quantum information. And certain fault tolerant operations or error resilient operations can be implemented natively using the properties of the underlying topological order. One downside of topological quantum codes, however, is that their utility for quantum error correction can be difficult to assess. Pauli stabilizer codes, on the other hand, are by definition given by an exactly solvable model. Their quantum error correcting properties in contrast to topological quantum codes can be well understood within the framework of the Pauli stabilizer formalism. However, Pauli stabilizer codes in general offer limited protection. There's no guarantee that they will keep your quantum information safe from local errors, for example. But it turns out we can have our cake and eat it too with topological Pauli stabilizer codes. Let me start with an example. This is the Z4 toric code. <laughs> and that's your example in order not to talk about the Z2 toric code. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah exactly. So the Z4 toric code is defined in a square lattice with a single four dimensional qubit at each edge. The operator algebra for the four dimensional qubit is generated by poly Z and poly X operators as represented here. They are both unitary operators and their fourth power is the identity. They fail to commute by a factor of I. The Z4 toric code Hamiltonian is then a sum of two types of terms. There's the vertex terms associated to each vertex of the square lattice and a plaquette term associated to each plaquette. You'll notice that each term is a product of poly operators and they're mutually commuting as it can be checked using the commutation relations. Therefore, this is a poly stabilizer code. Moreover, it is a topological quantum code. One can show that the Z4 toric code has a 16 fold ground state degeneracy on a torus and locally indistinguishable ground states. The other important property of the Z4 toric code that I'd like to point out is that it has anionic excitations, which can be useful for processing quantum information. Is that a question? Uh, yeah, uh, so a 16 fold ground state degeneracy means that it can store two qubits. That's all it means, right? Logical yeah, two, spaces, two qubits. Mm -hmm, two four dimensional qubits. That's right. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Can I ask uh, the first dumb question of the day? Does this work with a Z2 toric code? For someone that doesn't know anything about topological quantum codes, is this? Yeah, this absolutely. Work? Okay. Yep, this is a fairly natural generalization of the, the Z2 toric code. Here okay. I've replaced the Z2 Pauli operators, the two dimensional Pauli operators, with these generalized Pauli operators or Heisenberg Weyl operators, if you prefer. The 
commutation relations, instead of failing by a factor of minus one, now they fail by a factor of i. Mm -hmm. And the only difference in terms of the structure of the Hamiltonian is that here I've had to include some Hermitian conjugates just to ensure mm -hmm. that the Hamiltonian terms commute. But similar okay. modifications would work for like any prime power dimension, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even non-prime, right? By this prime here, it works for any dimension, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, in general- About the computation relations, but yeah, yeah, okay, I see that. Yeah, in general, the ground state degeneracy is N squared. So for Z2, you have a fourfold ground state degeneracy. All of these models, including the Z4 toric code, exhibit anionic excitations. These can be useful for manipulating the quantum information stored in the ground state subspace. Anions are local excitations, which can't be created or destroyed by local operators. Here are some examples of anionic excitations in the Z4 toric code. Oops. The first is created by a string of poly Z operators or poly Z operators applied along a path in the lattice. You'll note that this operator commutes with the Hamiltonian terms along the length of this string, but fails to commute with the vertex terms at the endpoints. Therefore, it creates local excitations. And moreover, I can't violate a single vertex term with a local operator. Therefore, this is a non-trivial anionic excitation. It's a local excitation, which can't be created or destroyed using a local operator. Similarly- so here, um, Sorry, I may interrupt. So the point here is that it can't be created as a single excitation. That's what you're saying? Okay. That's right, yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. And similarly, there are anionic excitations corresponding to violations of the plaquette terms. These are produced by a product of poly X's applied along a path in the dual lattice. If you'd like, the topological order of the Z4 Pura code can be understood as a deconfined Z4 gauge theory with matter. The violations of the vertex terms then correspond to E excitations or electric charges, and the plaquette violations correspond to M excitations or magnetic fluxes. It turns out that all of the anionic excitations in the Z4 Torah code are generated by the gauge charges and the gauge fluxes. They're generated by E and M excitations. Here are the anion labels. There are 16 anions in the Z4 Torah code. The anions form a Z4 cross Z4 group under fusion, where fusion means I take two anions, bring them together, and that is again another local excitation. It could be a non trivial anion. For example, E and M excitations fuse to an EM excitation. It's a plaquette violation bound to a vertex violation. What makes the anions especially interesting? and useful is that they have non-trivial exchange statistics. The E excitations, for example, are bosons. They're symmetric under interchange. Likewise, the M excitations are bosons. However, things get interesting when you can combine E and M excitations. This is a consequence of the aronov bohm effect of the Z4 gauge theory. Oh, sorry, is that a question? I, sorry, I, I don't think I noticed the raised hand. Uh, sorry, I think that was an accidental to raised hand. Yeah. Uh, no worries, no worries. Yeah, so the exchange statistics can get interesting if there's an E's bound to M because the aronov bohm effect in the Z4 gauge theory. The EM excitation, for example, is a semion. If I exchange to EM excitations, the wave function picks up a factor of I. Some other noteworthy exchange statistics of the anions in the Z4 toric code, the E squared, this is a boson. E squared M squared is also a boson, although it carries factors of M. The, uh, although there are magnetic fluxes bound to the gauge charges, 
uh, the factors of I cancel. And EM cubed is an example of an anti semion. Great. So there's our first example of a topological stabilizer code. Now we'd like to ask more refined questions like which topological stabilizer codes are useful for our purposes? To this end, it's helpful to develop a classification of 2D topological polystabilizer codes. There are, of course, many examples. There's the Z2 Torah code, the ZN Torah codes, the color code, the XZZX code, or more recently, the XYZ squared code. We need some way to sift through this large space of topological polystabilizer codes. And one way to do that is to classify the topological polystabilizer codes based on their underlying topological order. We say two such codes are equivalent if they have the same anionic excitations, if they have the same topological order. For example, the color code is equivalent to a stack of two Z2 toric codes. Now, unfortunately, we lose some microscopic details in this equivalence. The color code can be useful for certain, in certain instances in which the Z2 Torah code, it's more opaque. But what's important here is that we're capturing the universal properties. We're capturing the properties that are robust under perturbations. So how do we go about doing this? Well, we have to characterize the topological polystabilizer codes by their anionic excitations. We'll focus on abelian anion theories. This just means that the fusion is deterministic. There are no non-abelian anions here. The anions don't carry any topological degeneracy. That's in part because topological stabilizer codes don't admit non-abelian anionic excitations. So for an abelian anion theory, we need to specify three pieces of data. And this uniquely characterizes the topological order. We have to specify first the anion labels, this is the set of 16 anions for the Z4 Torah code. We have to specify the fusion rules. When I take anion AI and AJ together, this may behave like a new anion AK. And the last piece of information that we need to specify are the exchange statistics of the anions. This is the phase the wave function picks up if two of the anions are interchanged. Note that we don't have to define the braiding statistics of the braiding relations of the anions, that's actually fully determined by the exchange statistics for abelian anion theories. Because this, this phase, this U1 valued phase satisfies certain consistency conditions. Can that AK in the fusion rules ever be a <laughs> one? It can be a one, yep. Uh, okay. Yep. Uh, what about, uh, you know, swapping two different kind of anions. Yes, that would be like a half braid. It turns out ah, that doesn't okay. give you any gauge invariant data that that doesn't give you any universal data. A full braid does give you universal data. If I move, um, if I swap them twice, then they braid okay. around each other. That gives okay. me uh, data that's robust under perturbations. And that's okay. actually determined by these exchange statistics. Okay, uh, We'll get some number which would look similar to this, I guess, if you can derive that. From this, yeah, this. yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's cool, cool. it's a product of these these phases. Ah, okay, good. And let me comment. Go back to that that question about can AK be one? Yes, and 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 keep in mind that that one really represents a trivial anion. These are local excitations that can be created or destroyed with local operators. So we could have a situation where two anions fuse to some local excitation. It doesn't have to fuse to the vacuum necessarily. Great, okay, so here's what we need in order to characterize the topological order of a topological polystabilizer code. Work by the folks listed here in the bottom left corner shows that if we take any topological polystabilizer Hamiltonian, which is both translation invariant and defined on a system of prime dimensional qubits, and its underlying topological order is equivalent, equivalent to that of a stack of ZP toric codes. Or in other words, there always exists the constant depth circuit. This preserves the universal properties of the system. 
which maps the Hamiltonian via conjugation to decoupled copies of ZP toric codes. Uh, sorry, um, you mean prime or prime power? I mean, because even your Z2 example would not be included here. Um, yeah, this is, this is not prime powers, this is prime. Yeah, Z4 is not included here. Okay, good. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, <laughs> and that's our out. So good, that's the segue to what we asked, which is, are more exotic topological orders captured by polystabilizer codes on composite dimensional qubits, i.e. products of primes? Good. <laughs> yeah, good. How does prime come into this picture? Can you give me a like one line answer or anything? I can give you a convoluted answer later in the talk. Okay, Their cool. argument is fairly mathematical. So it's 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 really based on, on, on some mathematical properties of topological polystabilizer codes to find on prime dimensional qubits. Um, I, I can maybe establish some more intuition later in the talk. Can you give an example of this classification? I'm a bit confused by what you mean with decoupled copies of the toric code. Yeah, here's a, a concrete example. There is a unitary circuit, a constant depth unitary circuit that maps the color code Hamiltonian to the Hamiltonian of decoupled Z2 toric codes. They're two non-interacting layers of Z2 toric codes. They're completely disentangled. Mm, I see. And, um, and how to think about this in terms of anions? So how can you relate the anions of the color code to these two copies? That's a great code? question. Yeah, there's a mapping from the anions of the color code to the anions of two copies of Z2 toric codes. There's some way to relabel the anions so that they're the anions of the Z2 toric code. And then, okay. And then this labeling to the anions of the Z2 toric code, it's mm -hmm. somehow like two, two sets of anions? That's right, yep. It's a, the, the anion theory forms a product structure. Um, let's see if I can. Yeah, so the anion labels factor. So you have mm -hmm. anion theory one times anion theory two. You have yeah. the first Z2 toric code times the anions of the second Z2 toric code. Okay, okay, I understand, thanks. Good questions, thank you. Now I'd like to move on to our work. Before I do so, are there any lingering questions, comments, concerns, soliloquies, anything? Okay. okay froze. Now I'm gonna tell you about topological polystabilizer codes based on topological orders beyond stacks of toric codes. And to do so, we have to consider systems of composite dimensional qubits. I'll start with the double semion stabilizer code. Similar to the Z4 toric code, this is defined on a square lattice with a four dimensional qubit at each side. This is the same operator algebra that we saw for the Z4 toric code. Here's the Hamiltonian. It's now a sum of three types of terms. There's a vertex term, which combines both X and Z operators, a plaquette term, and edge terms. This sum is supposed to be over horizontal edges, labeled by X squared, and this sum is over vertical edges, labeled again by the X squared. First thing to notice is that the Hamiltonian terms are products of poly operators, and they're mutually commuting which can be checked again using the commutation relations here. Therefore, this is a Pauli stabilizer code. Moreover, it is a topological quantum code as we showed in our work. It has a fourfold ground state degeneracy on a torus and its ground states are locally indistinguishable. Now I claimed that this is distinct from toric codes and that it's described by a different topological order. To see that, we need to consider the excitations of this theory. One can, can you say what, yeah. uh, what it means by locally distinguishable? So it, toric code is locally distinguishable, right? The, the toric code, did you say? What did you say? Yeah, uh, the actual toric code. Yeah, 
Yeah, so maybe the simplest way to say it is if I consider two orthogonal ground states, yeah. two orthogonal logical states, there's no logical operator that maps between them. So the overlap with any logical local operator sandwich between them is zero. Ah, okay, fine. It means that local operators aren't able to corrupt our quantum information. They aren't able to map logical orthogonal logical states to one another. Perfect. Yeah, so the first type of excitation that I'd like to point out is created by a product of Z squared operators applied along a path in the lattice. It can be checked that this commutes with the Hamiltonian terms, except at the endpoints where it violates the vertex terms. It fails to commute with the vertex terms at the endpoints. The second type of excitation, which I'd like to point out, violates some combination of vertex terms and plaquette terms. It's formed by a product of poly X operators and poly Z operators along a path. The first excitation is called B, the second a label with S. In fact, these generate all of the anionic excitations in the double semion code. Um, so there's B, S, and another anion S bar, which is the fusion product of B and S. This means that the anions form a Z2 cross Z2 group under fusion. And here are the, oops, sorry. Here are their fusion rules. The boson squares to the yeah, trivial anion, the semion squares to local excitation, which can be created or destroyed with local operators. And similarly, the anti-semion squares to the trivial anion. I forgot about that animation. That's a topological twist of the anions. Here are the exchange statistics. The B anion is boring blue boson. The S is a semion. And S bar is an anti-semion. Now, importantly, these are distinct from the semions and anti-semions that appeared in the Z4 toric code. These have different fusion rules. The S anion squares to the trivial anion. So this topological polystabilizer code is characterized by a completely distinct topological order as compared to um, topological polystabilizer codes built on prime dimensional qubits. What I'd like to do next is describe how this, how we constructed this topological polystabilizer code. Before I do so, are there any questions, comments, concerns, proclamations? Uh, uh, I had a question on, so when you were on the Tori code example, you mentioned that it was like a Z4 deconfined gauge theory. Uh, is uh -huh. there no way to think about the double semion model? Oh, good, yeah, thanks for reminding me. I, I even labeled the anions in that way. The double semion anion theory can in fact be thought of as a twisted Z2 gauge theory. The B is the gauge charge, it's the Z2 gauge charge. The S is the Z2 gauge flux. And it's twisted in the sense that the gauge flux has exotic exchange statistics. Hmm. Okay, cool. Yeah. I'll comment question. on this. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, you know, you go first. No, good. Oh, I'll, I'll just say more about this when we get to twisted quantum doubles, which are examples of twisted gauge theories more generally. Yeah, okay. Um, a fusion rule is always characterized exactly by a group. For abelian anion theories, yes. It's going to be an okay. abelian group. Mm -hmm. okay. But otherwise, no, right? But otherwise, no, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah, for abelian anion theories, it's especially simple. In fact, the only data I need to give you is an abelian group and a quadratic form, something that tells you about the exchange statistics assigned to each of the anions, each of the elements of the group. Okay, thanks. Good, great. Now under the construction of our model. The first step in constructing the double semion stabilizer code is noticing that the anions of the double semion theory match anions of the Z4 toric code. B is similar to E squared. S is similar to the EM. They're both semions 
S bar is similar to EM cubed. They're both antisemions. However, the important distinction, which I noted earlier, is that they have distinct fusion rules. The semion S fuses to a trivial anion, EM fuses to E squared M squared, which is not a trivial anion. We can make these fusion rules match, however, by condensing E squared M squared. Condensation sets the E squared M squared excitation, identifies the E squared M squared excitation with the trivial anion, and that makes it so that EM fuses to the trivial anion. Let me describe that in more detail. The heuristic picture for condensation is as follows. The ground state of the condensed theory looks like a superposition of states with all possible configurations of E squared M squared excitations. This has two effects at the level of the anion theory. The first is that some of the anions become identified. In particular, E squared M squared becomes identified with the trivial anion. It no longer creates any excitations, so it's a trivial anion. This implies that anions differing by E squared M squared become identified. For example, EM is equivalent to E cubed M cubed in the condensed theory. The second effect of condensation is that some anions become confined. This happens when the statistics are inconsistent after this identification. For example, E becomes identified with E cubed M squared by fusing with an E squared M squared, but E is a boson and E cubed M squared is a fermion. So I can't consistently assign statistics to these anions. This happens whenever an anion has non-trivial braiding with E squared M squared. Uh, what do you mean with confined? By confined, I mean, these anions are thrown out of the theory. We no longer have these anions in our theory. I'll make this even more explicit once I get to the lattice model. Uh, thanks. Can I ask why is it this process called condensation? Why is it called condensation? Yeah. Um, that's a good question. I think it it's uh, motivated by condensed matter considerations and like a um, superconductor where the uh, pairs of fermions have been condensed. You know, I can pull them out of the vacuum freely. You know, I can create an E squared, M squared, a pair of these quasi-particles freely from the vacuum. That's a sense in which they've condensed. Okay. And like you yeah. will kind of be able to pull them out of the vacuum for free because the operators that create them are added to the stabilizer. Okay. Yeah, good. Yeah. And yeah. why is it called confined? <laughs> why is it con called confined? Yeah, still a good question. Let me get to that with the, the lattice model. Then, then you'll see okay. why it's confined. There's some good intuition for calling it confined. Cheers. So here are the effects of condensing E squared M squared at the level of the Z4 toric code anions. The anions marked with a red X are the confined anions to be described in more detail later. And the matching colors show the anions that have been identified after condensing E squared M squared. So one is identified with E squared M squared, EM is identified with E cubed M cubed. The deconfined anions can be represented by E squared, EM, and E cubed M. I actually, I think I drew EM cubed, but either one, they differ by E squared M squared. So what is the condensed theory? Well, after condensing E squared M squared, here's what we have. The anions can be labeled by one E squared, EM, and EM cubed. These form a Z2 group, Z2 cross Z2 group under fusion up to E squared M squared anions, which have been identified with the trivial anion. And their exchange statistics are shown here. Note that this is precisely the double semion topological order. We have a boson that fused to squares to the identity. We have a semion, which also fuses to the identity, squares to the identity, and we have an anti-semion. Here's the mapping of the labels for the anions. So at the level of the anions, we've shown that condensing E squared M squared produces the double semion topological order. The next step is to do this at the level of the lattice Hamiltonians. 
So we can condense by measuring the short E squared M squared string operators. These have the property that after condense, after measuring, we'll project the state into the plus one eigenspace of these operators, or at least we can make corrections or post-select for the plus one eigenstates. That's precisely the ground state of the condensed theory. Applying this operator is the identity. You Now that you mentioned uh, post-selection, um, can it also be kind of um, corrected afterwards? Like if you get a minus one, do you have to discard the whole uh, state or is it possible to do like kind of a Clifford frame analog? Uh, yeah, you can correct. So if you oh, find some think, minus right? ones, you can correct. Clifford frame, I mean, that would even mean that you would not even necessarily have to correct, but you could just interpret later outcomes differently, right? I, mean, I think that... That works too. You'll just have some signs here in your superposition. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. So the measurement of the short string operators can be implemented explicitly using the stabilizer formalism. The prescription goes as follows. We add the measured operators to the stabilizer group. So here's the Z4 Torah code stabilizer group generated by vertex terms and plaquette terms. We add the E squared M squared short string operators, and we throw out all of the stabilizers that fail to commute with the short string operators. This leaves us with a vertex term, a plaquette term, and these two edge terms. The corresponding stabilizer Hamiltonian is precisely the double semion stabilizer Hamiltonian. This also allows us some nice interpretation in terms of the, uh, for the Hamiltonian terms, we can think of the vertex term as a small loop of E M cubed anion. It's a small loop of the anti-semion. The plaquette term is a small loop of the boson. And these edge terms are the short E squared M squared string operators. These are what condenses the E squared M squared excitations of the Z4 toric code. Can I ask a vague question? So how did mm -hmm. you end up with those four generators? Was it through the interpretation that you just gave or was it by the thing you said above where you throw out something? Either way works, but the intuition in terms of small loops of anion strings led us yeah. to these stabilizers right away. Then you can check by dimension counting that these generate the full stabilizer group. Can you really quickly explain the throwing out thing again? I didn't quite follow. Yeah, so when you make a measurement, you throw out any stabilizers that fail to commute with the measured operator. This is a prescription of the ah, polystabilizer okay. formalism. For example, we no longer have this vertex term because it fails to commute with the E squared M squared string operators. Okay, cool. Intuitively, if you prefer an intuitive description, this product of X operators here is like a loop of M excitation. Mm -hmm. M braids non-trivially with E squared M squared. So we no longer can freely, Okay. we no longer have mobile M excitations. So we have to get rid of the closed loop of M excitations from our stabilizer group. Okay, cool, makes sense, thank you. So I should say closed loop of M string operator, not uh, excitations. Okay, now using this uh, double semion stabilizer Hamiltonian, we can see the effects of condensation explicitly. First, certain anions are identified after condensing E squared M squared. Here's the string operator that creates EM on the right. Here's the string operator that creates E cubed M cubed on the right. These differ by fusing with E squared M squared. And in fact, these string operators differ by products of stabilizers. You can multiply by edge operators and plaquette operators to go from one to the other. This agrees with the intuition that EM is identified with E cubed M cubed in the condensed theory. These create the same excitations according to the double semion stabilizer Hamiltonian. Second, we can see that there are confined excitations in this theory. by considering the string operator that creates E excitations in the Z4 Torah code. Just as in the Z4 Torah code, this creates 
vertex violations at its endpoints. And similar to the Z4 Tor code, these vertex excitations can't be created by local operators. However, these shouldn't be included as anions in our theory because as you'll notice, the string operator creates excitations along its length. That's because it fails to commute with the edge terms. That's the sense in which these anions are confined. There's an energetic penalty that grows linearly with the length of the string operator that creates them. What's interesting is that the presence of confined excitations are not possible in polystabilizer codes on prime dimensional QDETs. So this is unique to topological polystabilizer codes on composite dimensional QDETs. One interesting consequence of the confined excitations is the following. Consider an error model, consider a system where maybe it's most likely to have single Z errors. Somehow the Z squared errors are suppressed and the X errors are suppressed. But using this error correcting code, we can always correct single Z errors. That's because they can be identified immediately with the edge terms. Now, if there are Z squared errors, we're in trouble because the Z squared errors are invisible to these stabilizers. Or if there are Zs and Xs, those can also be invisible to these stabilizers. But it is interesting to note, and there's potentially some benefit for error thresholds in the presence of certain bias noise. Maybe if there's more bias towards having single Z operators. I can comment on this more later in a more transparent model if there's interest. Hopefully that addresses the questions about confined excitations. If not, let me know. This is everything that I'd like to say about the double semion stabilizer Hamiltonian. Now I'm going to move on to twisted quantum double stabilizer codes. The double semion is an example of a, the double semion anion theory is an example of a twisted quantum double. But twisted quantum doubles more generally are anion theories that can be obtained by gauging the global symmetry of a symmetry protected topological model. Let me break this down a little more carefully. We start with a system which is short range entangled and has a G symmetry. I'll assume this is a unitary on-site zero form symmetry. Zero form meaning that the symmetry operators act on the full space, they act on a co-dimension zero space. There's a prescription for gauging that G symmetry and mapping that global symmetry to local symmetries. And if we take as an input a G symmetric SBT model, the output is a G gauge theory. This has gauge charges and gauge fluxes. And if it was a non-trivial SPT phase, then the gauge theory is a twisted gauge theory. That twist manifests in the exotic exchange statistics of the fluxes. As I mentioned earlier, the double semi is an example of a Z2 twisted quantum double. Um, sorry, when you're doing this uh, gauging, are you doing, doing it on the level of the lattice or on the level of the continuum? Either way works. I'm imagining at the level of the lattice. Okay. There's an operator duality that maps from the G symmetric SPT model to the G gauge theory. Um, but on the level of the lattice model, you wouldn't end up on the, on the Q did that are four dimensional, right? I mean, um, or did you? explicitly construct the circuit mapping you to kind of a Z2 with decoupled ancillas or something. Um, let me see if I understand your question correctly. You're saying there's a Z2 SPT phase, non-trivial SPT phase built on qubits. You could gauge the Z2 symmetry there. That would produce something that's a non-Pauli stabilizer model. Assuming that this was a stabilizer model in the first place. Okay, phrase differently. Um, is there a way to sort of, because gauging is a duality, so you can kind of, you also can do the ungaging, right? Can yep, you do exactly. this with your final 
with your final uh, code and then end up with an SPT that is Z2 symmetric, but not on qubits where like the other fixed point models are uh, expressed on. Mm -hmm. Yep, and this is maybe the, the second to last slide I have. I'll okay. show that <laughs> from, from artistic quantum double models, which I, I still have to define, we can produce Pauli stabilizer models for SPT phases. Mm -hmm. um, but is the mapping always uh, unique? Like when you is get, them, um, like either way. Um, I want to say yes, although the mapping itself is not unique. There are, I can make changes to this mapping and still call it gauging the G symmetry. Okay, but, but like if you gauge a specific model, do you always get a specific gauge theory out? Um, yes. Yeah. Okay. And it goes uh, within some constrained Hilbert space. Yeah. Okay. And it goes both ways. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I mean, explicitly, this doesn't have a tensor product Hilbert space, but there are ways to lift that to a tensor product Hilbert space by adding the gauge constraints as energetic uh, constraints then it's not unique. Then there's some ambiguity. OK, cool. Yeah. Yeah. OK, so what have we done? We started with the anion theory for twisted quantum doubles with abelian anion theories and produced a corresponding topological polystabilizer code characterized by the anions of that input twisted quantum double. The twisted quantum double comes with anion labels. These are can be written in terms of the gauge charges and gauge fluxes, fusion rules, and exchange statistics. One thing that's kind of interesting is that twisted quantum doubles with abelian anions exhaust all abelian anion theories with gapped boundaries. I can say more about this later if there's interest, but this suggests that we have a complete classification of topological polystabilizer codes, because we expect that topological polystabilizer codes admit gap boundaries, and they're unable to describe non-abelian anions. All that leaves is abelian anion theories with gap boundaries. Here's a sketch of the construction. Uh, Follows this, yeah. Uh, not so fast. Can you go back just to digest this? Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, will you say more about the gap boundaries and the Lagrangian subgroups or so later, or is that, um, I, I suppose that you will say more about uh, the argument in a second now. Um, I wasn't planning on it, but I can. I have a slide with the argument on it. I can go to that now or later, either one. Let me see if I can find it. Yeah, let me see if I can find it. I'll give you the complete argument. Oh, wow. Bunch, nice. bunch, bunch of spoilers here. Okay, so here's the idea. This was worked out by, um, these folks. Okay. The idea is if you have an abelian anion theory with gapped boundaries, mm -hmm. I can show that it's a twisted quantum double with abelian anions. Mm -hmm. And I can do that as follows. I can gauge the one form symmetry of the anion theory. Mm -hmm. This is the symmetry generated by the string operators, the closed string operators of the anions in the um, abelian anion theory. Mm -hmm. After gauging the one form symmetry, this produces a G symmetric SPT model, assuming that the anions form a group G under fusion. Yes. And lastly, I can gauge that G symmetry. Mm -hmm. And this produces, by definition, a twisted quantum double okay. with abelian anions. Mm -hmm. So, therefore, all abelian anion theories with gap boundaries okay. are uh, twisted quantum doubles. Oh, sorry, I, I should mention where the gap boundaries were important. Mm -hmm. The gap boundaries ensured that. I could condense, consistently condense a set of bosons. There's the Lagrangian subgroup. So condensing this produces an SPT model. Okay, that was my, my Lagrangian subgroup question. Okay, good. I think yeah, all that, I kind of see the picture. Okay, thank you. I, I missed the most important step there, yeah. Um, I had a question on the argument. Um, so, you do, you, so you gauge the one form symmetry first and then the zero form symmetry. Uh, uh, does it have to be in that order? There's no zero form symmetry uh, initially. So you have to 
gauge the one form symmetry first. If that's so the zero form symmetry arises as a result of gauging the one form symmetry. Okay, okay, I see. that's right. Yeah, I'll, I'll try and make this more explicit um, on previous slides, which is a weird thing to say. I have one more question on this. Sorry, before you go back. <laughs> yeah, no worries. No worries. <laughs> Um, so you said the boundaries are important so that you can have Lagrangian subgroups, which you then condense, but you don't need the Lagrangian subgroup to condense, right? You don't always condense a full Lagrangian subgroup in the example in your paper, for example, you just condense one single boson. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what I'm saying is, if there's a gap boundary, that implies that there's a Lagrangian subgroup, such that if you condense all of the bosons in the Lagrangian subgroup, all other anions become confined or identified with the trivial anion. That means that after condensing this Lagrangian subgroup, you're left with an SPT model. Mm. You're left with something with trivial topological order. So the gap boundaries ensures the existence of a Lagrangian subgroup with the property that when you condense that Lagrangian subgroup, everything becomes confined. But for example, in your example, you're not condensing a whole Lagrangian subgroup, right? So I don't no, see why there, yeah, there are anions still left. Um, you'd have to condense further anions in order to trivialize our double semion stabilizer code. E squared M squared doesn't form a Lagrangian subgroup. I mean, the argument is just to show that everything can be mapped to a TQD via these right. two gauging. It's not um, the argument of like the condensation in your paper, just to- That's right, yeah, this, this is distinct. Yeah, but I'm, but I'm still wondering why, why it's important that you have a gap boundary in the beginning. Um, does, if you take three stacks of the three fermion model, do you have gap boundaries or not? The three stacks have, right? is still chiral, so you don't have gap boundaries. My but claim there, there is there's- So your argument would not work maybe then anymore. Maybe condense, right? No, so there's a boson that you can get condense, but that leaves you with a single copy of three fermion. And you can't go any further. There's no boson in three fermion that you can condense to get the- I think it leaves you with- model. Oh, okay. The, so then the, the, the important step wouldn't work. Yeah, the important <laughs> okay. distinction here is that you could have a condensable boson. We condensed E squared M squared to produce double semion stabilizer code, but E squared M squared doesn't form a Lagrangian subgroup. To form a Lagrangian subgroup, it needs to braid non-trivially with every other anion in the theory. Yeah. E squared, M squared by construction doesn't do that. There are some deconfined anions. So just condensing E squared, M squared, um, still, I'll still be left with topological order. Mm -hmm. Or in your example, oh, okay. there's no oh, Lagrangian okay, okay. subgroup. There's condensable bosons, but it's not complete in that sense. Yeah, okay. I uh, sorry, I hope I didn't derail the talk at this point. Um, no, it's good, that's interesting. Yeah, um, let's see the time. I've got three minutes here. Um, did I describe this yet? I don't think I've sketched this argument yet. Okay, so where were we? We were constructing topological polystabilizer codes for twisted quantum doubles with abelian anions, which I claim exhausts all abelian anion theories with gap boundaries. Here's how we went about doing this. We start with a stack of toric codes, Zn toric codes. These aren't necessarily defined on qubits. The first step is to identify anions in this stack of toric codes that reproduce the statistics of the gauge charges and gauge fluxes of the twisted quantum double. In most cases, that looks something like this. There's an M excitation drawn here in red, pinned together with E excitations in the layers below. This will produce some exotic statistics which may reproduce the statistics of gauge fluxes. The next step is to condense anions so that the fusion rules match those of the twisted quantum double. And that's it. This is precisely how we constructed the double semion stabilizer code as well. We noticed that the Z4 toric code anions or a subset of them match the statistics of the double semion anion theory. Then we condensed anions, namely E squared, M squared to make the fusion rules match. Now I can get to Julio's point about constructing polystabilizer models for symmetry protected topological phases. The idea here is to reverse 
the gauging process. We instead start with our polystabilizer model and gauge the one form symmetry. In particular, we gauge the one form symmetry generated by the gauge charges of the twisted quantum double. It turns out this forms a Lagrangian subgroup and these confine all the anions of the theory, leaving us with a, a G symmetric SPT. In practice, the way gauging the one form symmetry works is we first add G degrees of freedom, decoupled G degrees of freedom. These transform under a zero form G symmetry. The resulting model is a polystabilizer model, and it now has by hand a zero form symmetry. The next step to produce the GSPT is to condense gauge charges bound to G charges. So instead of just proliferating um, the gauge charges, we proliferate the gauge charges in such a way that they're bound to charges under the G symmetry. Maybe they're bound to spin flips, if you will. This results in the G symmetric SPT model, which is a polystabilizer model. Let me conclude now by summarizing and going over some potential future directions. And I'll try to make this quick. So what have I done? I've introduced the double semi stabilizer code. It is based on topological order beyond that of stacks of toric codes. I've shown that the double semi stabilizer code can be constructed by condensing E squared M squared excitations in a Z4 toric code. And I've argued that this can be generalized to build poly stabilizer models of twisted quantum doubles. And lastly, I described the construction of polystabilizer SPT models. Before I describe future directions and work in progress, are there any remaining questions, comments, concerns, size of relief, because we're almost finished? I mean, there's some questions along the way, but yeah, that's much more. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, perhaps one uh, slightly like metric based question. So like um, in your second point, you talk about uh, these excitations exhibiting some sort of confinement. Is there some sort of measure that you have for the amount of confinement that, ex uh, that is exhibited by each topological model? Um, that's an interesting question. I don't know how you would measure the levels of confinement. You can ask about how the energetic penalty scales Mm -hmm. with the length of the string operator, you could ask how many confined anions are there? Um, yeah, I'm not sure what the most natural metric is. And usually in quantum error correction, people <laughs> talk about the former, if I'm correct, like how the separation or the support of the operator creating them, how the scale, no, how the how sort of the number of non-commuting terms in your Hamilton, if you will, um, how the number scales with the support of the error, um, asymptotically at least. And this yeah. would always be linear, right? Because you always have these two body terms on your square lattice. This is an artifact yeah. of your lattice that you use. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. I mean, one, one, uh, yeah. yeah. I, an obvious question maybe is, is, is the following one. Like it's, it's related to the question that we got for our non-poly topological stabilizer codes from twisted quantum doubles, which is the, the very practically motivated question in what, like concerning what the, the error correction capabilities of the respective codes are expected to be. I mean, like what, what the advantages are for quantum error correction from codes of this type? I mean, is there anything to be said or is this, I mean, it, th there's no need for them to be practical to be this super exciting, but I was just curious, have you thought about this? Yeah, I think it's a, an exciting question. Um, there are a couple of things to say here. First, going to qubits has some advantages, has been shown uh, toric codes on higher dimensional qubits have some er higher error thresholds. Yeah, that's, that's Earl's work, right? I mean, uh, mm -hmm. Earl's work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in addition to that, our double semion stabilizer code has these confined excitations that has two effects. One, because it has confined excitations, there are fewer anions that you have to worry about running around and corrupting your quantum information. This comes at the expense of the logical subspace. We've reduced the logical subspace by a factor of four 
uh, on a torus, but now there are no E excitations, for example, running around and corrupting information. So there are fewer anions to deal with. There's also this effect of confinement that I noted earlier in that some, in some cases with the right bias, uh, certain errors can be corrected immediately. Um, I, and there's an example that shows this a little more clearly. We can build a toric code, a Z2 toric code on four dimensional qubits. And this mm -hmm. has confined excitations mm -hmm. and can be interpreted as code concatenation. Okay, yeah. good, thanks. Mm -hmm. Um, right. Uh, yeah. is, is, there, is there any way of like finding those models in arbitrary triangulations? Sorry, can you, can you I, I only got the last part of that. Uh, um, is there any way to define those stabilizer codes on arbitrary triangulations? Yeah, yes. Uh, yeah, so um, you can construct Z and toric codes on arbitrary triangulations. So you can carry out the same condensation procedure on a tri some triangulated lattice. Um, I see, but uh, also on like irregular stuff, because in your construction it kind of looked like you make use of the fact that you have like a regular lattice. Um, um, yeah, no, there's a, there's a way to um, define consistently define the e short e squared m squared string operators on an arbitrary triangulation. This is more or less stated in the appendix of our work in terms of um, cut products from group cohomology. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. And that can, I think we only worked it out explicitly in our paper for the double semion code, but that can be generalized straightforwardly you think for you writing can, down. Do you think you can even define some kind of space-time path integral that is kind of like to our theorem? On arbitrary triangulations with like kind of stabilize the sort um, constraints on the. That's an interesting question. I don't know what uh, what the poly stabilizer aspect means in terms of the space time picture. You can kind of define stabilizer tensors like um, kind of oh. like, like ground states or like abstractly of stabilizer codes, and then you I see. like make space time path integrals. Okay, yeah, yeah, I'd believe that. Yeah, um, in fact, in, in much older work, um, there is a group that constructed tensor networks for the double semion topological order ground state by condensing excitations in a Z4 PORA code. And I would suspect that their tensor networks are precisely what you're looking for. They're somehow stabilizer tensor networks. Thanks. Okay, I don't want to bore everyone for too long. So let me just leave my future direction slide up here. And um, let me see if there's anything else I'd like to, to comment on. It's a quick advertisement for work that's in progress, building subsystem codes associated to abelian anion theories. And these abelian anion theories may be um, gapless. They can include abelian anion theories with gapless boundaries, with chiral boundaries. And um, in some work that will hopefully be posted this week or, or shortly, uh, we built 3D polystabilizer codes, which host 2D abelian anion theories on the surface. The motivation for that work is slightly tangential, but nonetheless, we have polystabilizer codes with that property. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll stop here. Thanks. Wonderful. Yeah, that was hugely exciting. Thank you for this talk. Maybe it also uh, many questions along the way. Hope that was fine. Oh, that was excellent. Yeah, um, that was ideal. Wonderful. Um, uh, if we could uh, move on to further questions. Um, I had a question about your uh, symmetry gauging procedure that you described in a slide after this, I believe. Um, this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah the, this one, okay. Uh, so, um, right, so what I understood over here was you start off with some G-symmetric SBT model and you basically gauge away all the zero form symmetries and that gives you a twisted quantum double, right? Um, but, 
surely gauging the zero form symmetry of any arbitrary G symmetric SBT model wouldn't necessarily give you a twisted quantum double, right? So there must be some extra information encoded in the G symmetric SBT model that you start off with to gauge away to get your twisted quantum double model. Is this true? And this must have, um, like, you must have some sort of extra information that arises from gauging away the one form symmetry terms. Maybe I, I don't follow, but starting with any G symmetric model, I can always gauge the, the G symmetry. But do you always get a twisted quantum double out uh, is the question. I've defined twisted quantum doubles to be theories that are obtained by gauging a G symmetry. So the answer is. Yeah. Okay, 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 yeah. okay. And in fact, this is the inverse process. So this isn't just a, any random twisted quantum double. It's precisely this abelian anion theory. We just obtain the same theory back. Okay. I've gauged one form symmetry, then ungaged one form symmetry. You can call this ungaging the zero form symmetry if you'd like. I've just undone, the, just redid the same process and used that twisted quantum doubles are by definition gauged SPTs. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, sorry, the simpler argument than I made it out to be. Right, okay. Uh, there was another question that I had. So already you seem to be getting some very interesting behavior in terms of confinement by going to um, prime dimensions. Like, have you thought about what would happen like if you would increase the local dimension to like, let's say infin uh, like infinity? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, and gives me the opportunity to introduce this other model. So this is a Z2 toric code built on four dimensional qubits. So same Hilbert space as all the other models we've considered, same operator algebra, but here's the Hamiltonian. And this is obtained from the Z2 toric code by condensing M squared excitations. M squared excitations are produced by X squared operators. So we've thrown out the, the Z stabilizer term. But what's interesting about this model is that it can protect against arbitrary single Z noise because that can be detected by this X squared operator. In fact, this can be viewed as concatenating the usual Z2 toric code with an encoding of a qubit in a qubit. Mm -hmm. um, I don't remember if it's inner or outer um, code, but uh, here's the encoding of the qubit in the qubit. We'll take the stabilizers to be generated by X squared. And the logical operators are then the operators that commute with these stabilizers. It's going to be X and Z squared. Well, interestingly, with the constraint x squared equals one, x and z squared form the same operator algebra as the z2 Pauli operators. z squared squares to the identity. x doesn't square to the identity, but it squares to x squared, which is the identity. And they fail to commute by a factor of minus one. Therefore, we can concatenate the z2 Torah code and map each x operator in the z2 Torah code to a Z4X and each Z2Z to a Z squared Z, to, to, sorry, Z squared. That produces this Hamiltonian here with the stabilizer constraint X squared. Now you can do this in higher dimensional qubits as well. And that gives you better protection of your qubit that's encoded in the qubit. And you can even mix and match. So you can, Instead of just condensing M excitations, I can condense some combination of M excitations and E excitations. That gives me better protection against X noise and Z noise. There's some mixing and matching to, that you can do to, to have the right um, protection for the given bias. Yeah, so yeah, the, answer to, the short answer to your question is, yes, by going to higher dimensions, you can protect from more Z errors. Um, I don't know, like eight dimensions, maybe I can protect from two Z errors. Z squared errors can be detected easily, something like this. Right, okay. Cool. Yeah. So um, I have a question on the, like on the upcoming work that you mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. And I could wait a week, I guess, uh, for <laughs> to get my question answered in the, um, in the paper, but um, maybe you can... Uh, it's like a um, short spoiler, like the, on the 3D side, um, what's the um, topological phase perspective of the models? Is it a bulk SPT with a um, 
with a uh, yeah with a topological order on the boundary similar to I mean there are other models where like you on the you kind of encode a qubit on different boundary configurations of the 3D bulk, but then because it's coming from a bulk SPT, they kind of have a confinement through the bulks. So all the string operators on the boundary are sort of thickened into the bulk and in the bulk, they give rise to like a non-trivial syndrome if you. That's the right idea. Is yeah. it okay? okay? If you'd like, these are based on Walker Wong, models yeah okay yeah then where I'm... you input a pre-modular tensor category of modular tensor category if you'd like and that produces some 3d model if it's pre-modular there will be bulk excitations if it's modular then you just end up with a trivial topological order in the bulk and your desired anion theory on the surface okay we found our poly stabilizer walker long models That's similar to yeah. similar to the um 3d cluster state 3D cluster state is a simple example of a Walker Wong model based on the toric code topological order. You input toric code, you get out the cluster state. And there you have toric code topological order on the surface. Um, similarly, we can input some more exotic anion theory and get out an, um, a Pauli stabilizer model uh, built on higher dimensional q -dits. Okay, uh, do you know if this confinement property like the, that sort of the, the string operator on the boundary has to be supported in the bulk um, non-trivially. Um, is this a property of the walker wang models in general, or um, is it just, because I know of this work that um, I think they call it something like self-correcting symmetric topological quantum memory by, I don't remember exactly. <laughs> it was yeah. a few years ago and um, there they construct just like one model. And I thought it was, highly uh like uh just applicable to this one model so i'm curious if it holds for any walker one model yeah i don't want to say something incorrect yeah. <laughs> my my expectation is the answer is yes but i would need to be more careful any walker wong model includes like non-abelian anion walker wong models and things get strange there i don't know what yeah happens, because but I think that's the, the general idea. Okay, so because just to give you just the last a bit of background, uh, it's a like a um, it's a higher form SPT bulk, and that's kind of important for this confinement. I remember. Um, yeah, and, I don't know enough fact, about Walker Wang models to say that the bulk of a Walker Wang is higher form or not. The, yeah, by construction, it has a higher form symmetry. It has a one form okay. symmetry, but, but this isn't essential for protecting the topological order on the boundary. You can freely break the one form symmetry and still have the topological order, even non-trivial, you know, chiral topological order on the surface. Okay, thanks. Well, we're on that slide. Can you talk a bit, can you also give us a spoiler on what's happening on the project number two on the left of the slide? Yeah, absolutely. I'd be happy to. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I can say more about the 3D polystabilizer code construction first. One way to go about this is to leverage our twisted quantum doubles. This isn't actually how we did it in the work, but you can stack our twisted quantum doubles and do interlayer condensation. So by condensing um, layers in the bulk, by condensing bosons in the bulk, you can be left with you know, an anion theory A on the top and A bar on the bottom. If the twisted quantum double is like A, A bar. Yeah, okay, yeah, sorry. Let me go back to subsystem codes. So stabilizer no, codes. No, quickly while you were at this, what does, oh. what does this mean, this interlayer condensation? So you just consider this A bar A as one phase and then you condense in there. Yeah, so give me an abelian anion theory A. And just for a simple case, let me assume that A is modular, meaning that every anion braids non-trivially with some other anion. There are no transparent anions. Then I can construct a twisted quantum double from A by stacking A with its time reverse conjugate A bar. So I'll have blue on the top, pink on the bottom. That's our twisted quantum double. Now I'll stack a bunch of these twisted quantum doubles together and condense the gauge charges between the layers. So pink on the top, blue on the bottom. Oh, see, I've drawn it here conveniently. 
So the interlayer condensation, I'll produce, I'll condense the Lagrangian subgroup of that twisted quantum double. This confines all the excitations in the bulk. And the only layers that are left unaddressed are the top surface layer and the bottom surface layer. So we're left with A on the surface and the in theory A bar on the bottom surface. Cool. Yep. Nice. Yeah. Okay, right. So the story here um, is as follows for a stabilizer code, you can uniquely ascribe a, a exactly solvable Hamiltonian, a commuting Hamiltonian. For subsystem codes, it's more natural to associate it with a parameter space of Hamiltonians with non-commuting terms. We can associate an anion theory to this parameter space by considering the common conserved quantities by considering the one form symmetries of these Hamiltonians. So the construction roughly works like this. Starting with an abelian anion theory, we can build a twisted quantum double, A cross A bar. Then we can explicitly break the one form symmetries of say the A bar layer by adding gauge operators that break this A bar symmetry, the one form symmetries you add short string operators for the A-bar anions. The resulting models will only have the one-form symmetries of the A-layer. So it'll be a subsystem code with the one-form symmetries of the A-layer that gives us a subsystem code associated to the A-anion theory. One example is um, Bombin's topological subsystem code. There, I'd say that is characterized by three fermion anion theory. The one form symmetries correspond to loops of fermion string operators. Yeah, at the quantum double, you would start with the color code and then you. Yeah, yeah, in order to produce that, well, in order to produce that, we'd start with three fermion. Yeah, but then- By the construction here. When you, exactly. So yeah. this, the topological quantum double that you get from stacking A and A bar is the color code, right? It's color code, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And then what, what other models can you get? Or like, what's the power of this approach? Yeah, so, so, so far we can construct, for any modular anion theory, we can construct a corresponding subsystem code. So this extends the classification of subsystem codes, if you will. We're still working on inputting a pre-modular anion theory to build a topological subsystem code. Okay, I'm not sure what that means, but it sounds important. Oh, sorry, oh, sorry. Pre-modular -pre means that um, there are transparent anions. There are anions that braid trivially with all other anions. Kataev's honeycomb model can be thought of as a topological subsystem code that doesn't encode any qubits. In Kataev's honeycomb model, there's a stabilizer, a one form symmetry corresponding to a loop of emergent fermion. Mm -hmm. This loop of emergent fermion, um, you can encode any qubits because there's no anion in this theory that braids non-trivially with that fermion. There's only this transparent fermion. It braids trivially with itself. Um, that's an example of a pre-modular theory. So I'd call Kataev's honeycomb model a topological subsystem code based on a pre-modular anion theory, specifically one that just has the trivial anion and this fermion. Mm -hmm. So that was a lot of hand waving. I don't know if anything made sense oh. there. Okay. So, I mean, not really, but <laughs> oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. more because I don't know what you're talking about, not because you explained it badly. <laughs> okay. That's all good. Um, have you thought much about non-abelian anions uh, in the context of your work? Um, well, so the goal of the, the project that I discussed was to construct Pauli stabilized codes or Hamiltonians more generally aren't able to host non-abelian anions. There's a fairly clear uh, no-go theorem. So non-abelian anions won't appear in any of these stabilizer models. That's what I can say. <laughs> that seems fair. <laughs> um. But uh, that, that being said, 
um, some of these subsystem codes, uh, let's find it again. The one thing I can say about non-abelian anion theories is that subsystem codes uh, correspond to this parameter space, this phase space of Hamiltonians. Somewhere in this phase space, you could have non-abelian anion theories. All that's required is that um, it includes the anions of your given one form symmetry. And there's some precedence for this. I argued um, maybe not very clearly that Kataev's honeycomb model is a topological subsystem code and that hosts non-abelian anions in a particular region that's of this phase space. So it's kind of um, just to uh, that I understand this diagram correctly. So you have like a Hamiltonian that is built out of, I don't know, you have H1 being a stabilized Hamiltonian, H2 being a stabilized Hamiltonian, and then you just take their superposition weighted with J1, J2, for example. And then you get a, because I mean, H1 and H2 don't have to be commuting. So the full Hamiltonian is not a stabilized Hamiltonian. Um, is that yeah. sort of a simple example of what you're doing? Or is it more intricate that you put more terms in that? The way I'd say it is, if you have a topological subsystem code, then this comes with local gauge operators. Yeah. You can build a Hamiltonian out of those local, local gauge operators by just assigning a, a coefficient j to, to those gauge operators. This defines your Hamiltonian, and you can tune between these. There's, this is a higher dimensional phase space that I've, that I've drawn here. I see, okay, okay. Uh, so the gauge operators are basically like the extra terms that you would have in your uh, on the, uh, okay, 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 I see. Not extra, yeah. the only. Right. Yeah, they're, they're, they're what leads to the non-commutativity of mm -hmm. these Hamiltonians, yeah. Right. There's no like systematic way of generating a specific anion from these subsystem codes, is there? Or... Um, I'm not sure what you mean exactly. Um, right. Uh, so, like, uh, you said, like, you got like non abelian anions uh, from like in a particular uh, part of the uh, of this parameter space, right? Uh, mm -hmm. There's no systematic way of determining which kind of non abelian anion you would get. Not that I know of. Um, I think the general intuition, and this is really based on um, one example, but the general intuition is that you get a minimal extension of your theory. Uh, you get a minimal modular extension. You get a minimal extension of your theory where all the anions break non-trivially with one another. So in Kataev's honeycomb model, this example that I keep going back to, which may or may not make sense, there um, the anion theories all have to include a fermion. And one of the simplest extensions is to the icing anion theory with non-abelian anions. So Maybe that gives a, an indication of which non-abelian anion theories will appear, but I don't have any general arguments. But how do you do this modular extension? Like, what's the procedure? Um... Uh, yeah, that there you, you, you go ask a mathematician. I, yeah, I, I don't, <laughs> I don't really know. Somehow, this, this your theory includes your your theory as a as a subgroup or something like this, in in a subcategory. In a, reasonable sense that okay. I don't know. Uh, okay. Yeah, sorry. No, 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 no worries. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, <laughs> that was great. Quite a discussion. <laughs> that was really um, very exciting. Thanks for this.